Gospel of Thomas is unusual in that we read it twice. Once on Pascha itself at the Agape Vesper, and once eight days later today. And largely the reason for this is that the account in the Gospel itself is built around a week period. With, at the beginning, a week ago, the Lord appears to all of his disciples in the evening as they are gathered. He gives peace to them. He reveals himself to them, but Thomas is absent. And when the others tell Thomas that they had seen the Lord, that he had risen, that he had appeared to them, he says, I will not believe it unless I see him with my own eyes, unless I put my hand, unless I put my finger in the print of the nail in his hand, unless I put my hand in the hole of the spear in his side, I will not believe. So eight days later, the next first day of the week, the Lord's day, the eighth day. He's there again. They are all together, and Thomas is there too. And the Lord appears. He is present. And he says to Thomas, first he gives, he says, peace to them all. Then he says to Thomas, although Thomas knows the Lord wasn't there when I said these things, and yet the Lord responds to his request. And he says, come here, Thomas. Here are my hands, my feet. Touch the print of the nails. See the holes that are still present. See the hole in my side. It is truly me, risen from the dead. I'm not an apparition. It's not a ghost. Touch, see, feel, and understand. You can believe your senses. I am truly here. And Thomas is amazed. He's probably a little embarrassed to be called out in front of all the others, and yet it is exactly what he asked for. But he doesn't say any of these things. He simply speaks to Jesus. He's not thinking about his own embarrassment, his own shame. He is looking at the Lord who he has touched, who he sees, who he had grieved, and who he now rejoices to see resurrected. And he says, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus says to him, oh, so you believe now that you've seen me. Well, good for you. Also, blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. And then the evangelist, John, sort of adds in an editorial comment. He says, we haven't written these things for no reason. We write these things, I write these things, so that all of you may hear and understand that we apostles, and Thomas specifically, truly witnessed the Lord risen from the dead. So that hearing these truths, you may trust in his name and be saved. So there are a number of things that are going on. First, we are still reliving the days of the Lord's resurrection. We are moving through the gospel as we did all through Holy Week, moving towards the Passion. We continue that journey afterwards seeing what happened eight days on the eighth day after the Lord's resurrection, because it's the eighth day. We are reliving this gospel narrative. Second, in a sense, we are beginning the rest of the year. Our year, at least our reading of the gospel, our life begins at Pasch. And all of what we call bright week, I said that right, it's a long word and I, we don't say it frequently. The week of the new creation is what it means. This week is all celebrated as it is a single day. I was talking with some of the other clergy 
about a question because although we do liturgies, we did the liturgy for St. George, but the priest doesn't take care of. He doesn't prepare to do the liturgy as though it is a liturgy standing alone all by itself because in a sense we celebrate all week long the same pasta, the same liturgy. No one would come to church, so we only did it on the first day, on Monday, on St. George. Maybe people would come. Maybe we should do liturgies every day of brightness. You all tell me what you think, and we'll plan this schedule for next year. But whether we do the liturgy or not, the liturgy, when it is done, is done as it is a single day. That day of Pascha lasts all week long. So that on this day, the eighth day, the new day, we begin our Sunday celebration of the Lord's resurrection, which we continue all through the church year and all through our lives. This day, Sunday, the day of the Lord, is at the center of our week, at the center of our lives. It is the foundation on which we stand, the root that sustains us, the basis on which everything else is built. The third, our faith, our relationship God comes to us not, not in a distant way, not in an intellectual or a theoretical way. It comes on the basis of a personal experience of the apostles and their witness to us of that personal experience. This is very important. We don't learn about Jesus and his resurrection from books that are full of complex theology and philosophical ideas. We learn about it in the way that we encounter any human being. For instance, Daniel, do you know the man sitting next to you? I don't. Introduce me. How are you, Jacob? It's nice to meet you and then we can shake hands. And then we know each other. Not well, but we've touched. I know you're real, you know I'm real. At least as far as we can touch our senses, as far as we can trust our senses. But it didn't happen until the person who already had the relationship told me, Father, this is Jacob, my friend. Make sure to say hello to Jacob at the end of the service. But this is what the apostles are doing. They are saying, we met Jesus. We walked with him, we heard him, we knew him. And we know that he died. We bear witness to that. We saw him dead. We saw him buried. And then we heard that he had risen. We went and saw the tomb. It was empty. There was nobody there. Just the grave cloth lying there on the stone where he had been laid. And then when we went out again, he appeared to us. And we thought maybe he was a ghost. Maybe he was a spirit. Maybe it was just an apparition. But he said, touch me. Feel me. He said, give me food so that I can eat. He proved to us that he was truly risen. We felt him. We heard him. We saw the food go into his mouth and disappear. He is truly risen in the flesh. And we are going to, and we are telling you about it so that even after we die, that witness still stands. This is not a sermon about evidence, per se. But if, for instance, we wanted to know whether some obscure king in the 8th century existed in Northern Europe, what would we accept as proof? Documentation, writing on stone or on parchment or on whatever might survive those years, saying that someone met this king and encountered him. We would say, well, either they're really trying to take us for a ride 
Why would they do that? Before it really happens. And when there are multiple sources, all saying the same essential point, this person who was dead rose. We touched him. We spoke with him. We encountered him. It is on this basis that we believe, but not only this. Not only this. Because what is it that we Christians do when we come into the church? We come in, we light a candle, we see the icon, we see the images of what had happened. We see painted up on the wall that same account of what the apostles and the saints bore witness to and described so that we can see and understand. But that is not all. We come and we stand here. Maybe we bring the bread and the wine in offering, and they are offered on the altar table to our Savior who is behind it as the one who is celebrating this mystery. We offer ourselves to him, and we ask him to come down and offer himself to us. And when we go forward and we receive Holy Communion, what do we do? Like Thomas, we reach out and we touch the flesh and blood of the Lord. In the words of the psalmist, we taste and see that the Lord is good. So that when we go out into the world, when we speak to other people, friends, neighbors, when we turn the other cheek and are gracious even to our enemies, and they ask, why? Who are you? What is important to you? What is the core of your being? Where do you get your strength from? We can say, from the Lord, who touches me, who heals me, who sustains and raises me up, as he himself has risen from the dead. Come and see that the Lord is good. This is the Christian life, all contained in this single passage. We wait for the Lord, we question, we doubt, and our doubt is fulfilled. That doesn't mean life gets easy. Thomas still died of a spear wound, preaching in India. It was a hard life that he led, but he did it knowing what was important, knowing where the source of life and strength was. Not in possession, not in pleasure, not in the honor and respect of the people around him, in the Lord and God whom he had touched, whom he had seen, and whom he declares to all of us today. Let us be imitators of Thomas. Let us seek to touch, to taste, and to see indeed how good the Lord is. Please stand.